thank you for that. So um, I need to thank a, a number of folks. Um, and I also apologize for the venue change for those of you that might have went to Bowdoin first. Um, Bowdoin had ample opportunity to sponsor this event and they, they decided not to. And that's uh, too bad and you could read into that what you'd like. And uh, Paul, Paul may elaborate on that. Um, but it's too bad because what Paul does and what Sea Shepherd does and other groups, maybe ours, uh, we, we advocate and we um, uh, do that in a fashion that makes some people uncomfortable. And there's actually probably a number of college courses, uh, probably at the graduate level, in looking at those issues. So anyway, um, tonight wouldn't be possible without a major donor. Uh, if you support Friends of Mary Meeting Bay, and there's a lot of non-members here, um, and I know a lot of you uh, signed up on a coupon out there, you're, uh, you're supporting an organization that does a lot with virtually nothing. We have one, part, we have one uh, staff person, Jeff DeRosa, who is um, somewhere out. Where are you? Hey. Is Jeff uh, and, and, and he's new, and this is a trial by fire. So appreciate your patience. We've got a great group of uh, helpers out here. I want to thank them. I won't name them all, but you walk by them all to get in here. So, uh, some great board members, if you could stick your hands up, there's a number of board members here. Sarah, Andrew, uh, Tom, Leon, um, Kathleen is the next board member kicking around here somewhere um, in the back. Um, one of our board members, Nate Gray, couldn't make it tonight, regretfully, because he works with Department of Marine Resources and he's up at the Benton Falls um, Dam on the Sebastopol River where they're moving alewives migratory fish that, uh, that are key forage stock for the Gulf of Maine. Everyone, their purpose in life is to get eaten. And all the larger fish in the Gulf of Maine eat them. And uh, the, real uh, the real migratory run started yesterday, uh, or maybe the day before. But yesterday, uh, Nate moved six, uh, 60,000, almost 70,000 alewives up through the fish lift there. And today, he was up to 100,000 when I talked to him. So. Um, as he said, it's a good problem to have. Uh, a, a better, well, it would be better if there was no dam to start with. But, but considering the dam is there, uh, they're doing well. And the Kennebec right now has the largest alewife uh, run in the state. So, um, yeah, so I want to thank our major donor for making this possible. I want to thank Patagonia for their support over many years of the speaker series. There's a number of folks from the store over here. Um, they donated some things for a raffle out there. But this is our 15th year of, of doing this series, and they've been with us for quite a while. Um, I'd thank Point of View Helicopters, except not enough people bought a raffle ticket to auction those off. So it's your last chance. $50 gets you membership with Friends of Mary Meeting Bay and a great ride with me. Um, if you do it soon, we can take you on a bald eagle nest survey, but it could be a working flight or a scenic flight. We're going to do the raffles. Um, after Paul and just before a question and answer period. So uh, if you want to sneak out there and get a, get a ticket, you better do so pretty soon. I uh, also want to thank the Harris Seekit Inn um, for special sponsorship of this event and putting Paul up while he's here. The Maine Maritime Museum for stepping in when Bowdoin wouldn't take our money. Uh, and, uh, you know, probably fitting to be in the city of ships anyway here and by the river. And also, uh, so yeah, so Christine Titcomb and Jason uh, Moran, particularly from the Education Department here. Uh, and then MPBN, who is taping this for their series, uh, Speaking in Maine, which we appreciate them doing. I don't know when that will be on, but it will be on at some point. So uh, a, a few words about our organization, and then I'll actually introduce our speaker. Um, Friends of Mary Meany Bay has been around, uh, still hear me okay? Yeah, all right. Uh, around since 1975, uh, working in a very polluted bay. Mary Meeting Bay is upstream here about uh, five miles or so. The confluence of six rivers, uh, the Kennebec and the Androscoggin being the largest, drain about 40% of all the water in Maine. So we were active in the old days and then slacked off, I think, after the Clean Water Act effects kicked in, kind of reborn in 1990. And we utilize uh, research, uh, conservation, we're a land trust, education, and advocacy to accomplish our mission, which is really to improve the unique ecosystems up in this area, in the bay. The bay is tidal freshwater. And again, I know there's a lot of people here from quite a ways away, some as far away as Quebec. 
some from the Moosehead area, so people have come a long way to hear our speaker tonight, and we appreciate that. Um, the bay is the only place in the Gulf of Maine that's home or, or spawning, uh, spawning habitat, nursery habitat, for all 12 of the, the diagermis or migratory fish in the Gulf of Maine. Uh, one of those is catagermis, it's an, the American eel, most of its life in fresh water, and then spawns in salt water, and then dies, and the rest are anadromous, striped bass, smelt, a couple kinds of sturgeon, alewives, most of their lives in salt water and up into fresh water to spawn. So it's the largest uh, uh, staging area in the northeast for uh, migratory waterfowl in the fall and the hot spot for bald eagles. So again, get that helicopter flight, come on an eagle survey. Um, so a uh, couple of the things that we've done over the years, cutting edge research projects using uh, aerial photography, GIS to look at land use changes and vegetation changes over time. Uh, using caged freshwater mussels to find pollution hotspots, contamination hotspots, a uh, great circulation study of the area uh, using homemade drifters with GPS units in them and so forth. Um, it's a very complicated system. It's hard to get out of the system. So if you're pollutant and you get in there, you're going to stay there for a long time and the repercussions. We educate probably a couple thousand kids a year uh, and then we have speaker series like this and uh, uh, summer outdoor series and we protected probably 1500 acres of land directly right around the bay it's mostly high value wildlife habitat for the fish and the birds our feeling is that while they're land trusts and they're people that do education it's important to tie all these things together because it is one big ecosystem so they all work together no sense in protecting a piece of land if the water going by it is is, is really polluted or vice versa so uh, on your chair, there's some blue brochures. We hope you'll consider joining us if you haven't already. Uh, some of the, uh, just some of the advocacy stuff we've been doing lately. We're in, we had four lawsuits going on last summer, and right now we're down to kind of two or one and a half. We're getting going again on phase two on a second. But those are, might be of interest. Um, the, um, we were instrumental in seeing that the Atlantic salmon uh, in the major rivers in the state got on the endangered species list a few years ago. And until the wildlife services, the National Marine Fisheries Service and the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service actually um, issue incidental take permits, it's illegal to kill a salmon. And right now, all of these dams here, there's four dams on the lower Kennebec and three on the Andro, uh, they're killing fish. And they're often killed by, directly by turbines, they have to pass through the turbines, but they can also delay migratory fish just by the nature of having a dam there with a little passage to get up. So we have a lawsuit going on against four, the four dam owners of the seven dams here. And it's the first time ever that corporations have been sued for illegal take of an endangered species, as opposed to suing the government agency. And, and uh, on the St. Croix, which separates us from Maine, which is sort of Paul's old stomping ground, uh, in 1995 and again in 2000, 97, 95 and again in 2005, the state of Maine saw fit to extirpate alewives, which again, the key fish, They're responding in the legislature to a very small but vocal minority of smallmouth bass fishermen up in that area who suffered a bad year of fishing, uh, really because water levels were down and the bass liked to spawn in the shallow areas and uh, they blamed it on the alewives, who are really herbivores. And so they were, they were successful in closing off the river to alewives. And so we had that in court and we just got a decision against us from a new justice in federal court. And we're looking at round two right now and we'll be moving ahead with that this week probably. So anyway, uh, so I want to thank actually, I throw out a thank you to the Center for Biological Diversity, the National Environmental Law Center and Earth Justice. They're all big organizations. They do a lot of legal stuff and over the years, with our budget, which is really small, we've been very successful in getting groups like that to partner with us to do these legal actions. So our speaker, um, what, what do we do when laws protecting our planet, the only one we have, are continuously ignored, when violence against nature becomes accepted as the norm, and when the legislative and judicial systems fail and enforcement is scoffed at? Uh, in an effort to effectively grapple with and find a solution to these issues, Captain Paul Watson in 1977 founded Sea Shepherd, an international nonprofit direct action marine wildlife conservation organization specializing in aggressive but nonviolent interventions against unlawful exploitation of ocean wildlife and habitats. 
Sea Shepherd now has more than three decades of experience closing illegal whaling, sealing, and fishing operations and has established itself as a leading marine interventionist group in the world. Whether working in partnership with government agencies or operating in accordance with the provisions of the United Nations World Charter for Nature, Sea Shepherd is a tireless advocate for the enforcement of international treaties, laws, and regulations protecting marine species and their environment, and doesn't hesitate to enforce these legal charters as circumstances require. The efforts of Watson's largely volunteer crews in Antarctica saving whales from Japanese whalers have been popularized by the claimed and often harrowing Animal Planet television series, Whale Wars. And I should interject here that we've got a number of Sea Shepherd folks from the Boston area here tonight. So I appreciate you folks coming up. So lesser known is that Sea Shepherd operations also have been successful around the globe, intercepting poachers in the Galapagos Islands, uh, shutting down the illegal whaling operations in various oceans, uh, blockading sealing ships, rescuing dolphins in Japan, patrolling beaches in the Caribbean to stop turtle poaching, and confiscating illegal drift nets and long lines all over the world. And Paul may get into his new shark, shark anti-shark finning campaign tonight, I'm not sure. Uh, Captain Watson's lifelong calling as a conservationist began as a child growing up not far from here across the St. Croix River in St. Andrews, New Brunswick. His career as a seaman began in 1967, the Canadian Merchant Marine, followed by the Canadian Coast Guard, or I should say the Merchant Marine, uh, followed by the Canadian Coast Guard. Watson majored in communications and linguistics at Simon Fraser University in British Columbia and is a successful author. He's been a professor of ecology in Pasadena, California and an instructor in the UCLA Honors Program. Watson has been named one of the environmental heroes of the 20th century by Time Magazine, one of the 50 people who can save the world by The Guardian in the UK, newspaper in the UK, and received the Daily Points of Light Award from former President George H.W. Bush. <laughs> Whose side are you on? Yeah, yeah, the, the first George Bush, the president. <laughs> he didn't vote for him. So, yeah. so in 1969, uh, uh, Watson co-founded the Greenpeace Foundation in Vancouver, British Columbia, from 1971 to 1977. He served as first officer uh, on Greenpeace voyages, and during a campaign against Russian whalers in 1975 was the first to implement his tactic of putting activists in a small inflatable boat between the harpoons or the harpooners and endangered whales. From 1976 to 1977, Watson led all the Greenpeace expeditions to protect harp seals on the ice flows of eastern Canada. 1977, uh, Paul identified the need for an international direct action organization focused specifically on marine conservation with an emphasis on marine mammals and fish, neither of which obviously could defend themselves, and he founded the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society. Tonight, Captain Watson is here to share experiences and lessons from his more than 30 years sailing under the Sea Shepherd Jolly Roger and explore with us the pressing need for the effective advocacy techniques, the persistence and the passion required to save some of the world's greatest wildlife and ultimately ourselves. Uh, if I was the Secretary of Navy for a day, I'd give Paul one of these nice big ships up here at Bath Ironworks that are, that are meant for, for uh, purposes that uh, I don't support and that a lot of us probably don't. Arguably, it's better off uh, saving marine mammals than uh, being an aggressor in parts of the world that we have no business in. So join me uh, with a warm welcome for Paul Watson. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can, can, can you all hear me? Yeah. Okay. Well, it's a pleasure to be here uh, for three reasons. One is like coming home. Uh, I was raised in St. Andrews, uh, New Brunswick, uh, right across there uh, on the border. And um, in fact, 
uh, that's where I got started rescuing beavers when I was 10 uh, over in, uh, in, uh, in uh, just outside of St. Andrews in that area. But um, I was also, uh, I was raised on the border, I still live on the border, I live in Friday Harbor, Washington now, I can see Canada, I'm sort of like Sarah Palin in that way, <laughs> except, that, except that I can actually see Canada from where I'm at. Where I'm at. But uh, I remember, uh, what, what, I, what I used to do when I was uh, 8 to 10 uh, was, I was, a, I was a smuggler, uh, and a major smuggler, because I discovered very early that Canadian uh, housewives would buy American margarine if I could get it across the border. So I used to, because the Canadian margarine at the time was white, and you had to put all these additives in it to get the yellow color, but the Americans had the four little sticks. So I, I bought it for a quarter and sold it for 30 cents. Uh, because back then, we just ran back and forth across the borders and the customs officers all just didn't even know our name, didn't even ask. We were kids, we could go do whatever we wanted. So we really had a free border at that time. So today, uh, in tune with the fact that I was raised in a border town, I am both a U.S. citizen and a Canadian citizen, so I guess I'm a North American. But the other reason, uh, the second reason is that uh, this is like home, is we've had our ships here before in Eastport in Portland uh, during the 80s when we were doing the SEAL campaigns. And uh, the other reason is that uh, there's a lot of crew members that have come from Maine. In fact, there's uh, people right here now, Bob Levanti, who was with us in 91, Josephine Musabelli, who was with us in 83, um, Kelly Higgins, who's on board the ship right now, and um, also in the audience uh, is Jerry Conway, who actually was working for a DFO at the time, who actually, I think, arrested me at one time. But uh, Jerry, Jerry, Jerry's now working uh, to protect uh, right whales here in, in Maine waters. Uh, so he's no longer with the DFO, which I used to call, call the Department of Fishy Business uh, in, in Canada. He's now uh, on the side of the whales, which is, which is wonderful. I uh, started out with um, Greenpeace back in 1969. Um, we had a demonstration at the border between uh, Vancouver and uh, it was on the Washington, uh, British Columbia border. And uh, it was against nuclear testing in uh, Amchitka in, in the Aleutians. And people were there for two reasons. It came from two different groups, the Quakers for peace and the Sierra Club for the environment. And I was probably the only person there for the reason that for, for a unique reason, it's because uh, Amchico is a wildlife preserve, and I said, it's a ridiculous, you can't go onto that island with a gun, but you can blow a five megaton bomb up underneath of it. And it killed a lot of sea lions and uh, sea otters uh, in previous tests, so that was the reason I was there. But these two groups, the Sierra Club and the uh, Quakers, got together and they set up a group called the Don't Make a Wave Committee, uh, because we had this idea that the nuclear test could cause a tidal wave because it was still fresh in our memory from the 64 tidal wave from the uh, earthquake that hit uh, Hilo and Vancouver Island. And uh, so at one of the early meetings, um, somebody at the meeting, uh, I think it was Bill Darnell who was a cook on our first voyage, he uh, left and somebody said peace and he said make it a green piece and so that was the origin of the name and Bob Hunter said oh that's a great name for the ship so the ship became the green piece and in 1972 we changed the name of the don't make a wave committee to the green piece foundation the name foundation by the way came from Isaac Asimov's foundation trilogy we were all science fiction nuts at the time I think we still are but um, the so that was the origin of it and so I, was, I stayed with Greenpeace for a number of years, but in 1975, in June 1975, I had an experience that really changed my life forever. And we had come up with this idea that uh, we could protect whales by simply getting between the harpoons and the whales. We were reading a lot of Gandhi at the time, and we felt that all we had to do was put our bodies on the line, and nobody was going to risk to taking a human life to kill a whale. And so after all months of planning, Bob Hunter and I found ourselves in a small little rubber boat, 60 miles off the coast of California. This was before the 200 mile limit. And uh, in front of, in behind, we were in front of a 150 foot Soviet harpoon vessel that was bearing down on us in, uh, at full speed. And in front of us were eight magnificent sperm whales that were fleeing for their life. And every time the harpooner on the Soviet vessel got a, sat down to try and get a shot, I would uh, maneuver the boat and block his path. And this worked for 25 minutes or so until the captain, the Soviet captain, came down the catwalk and he screamed into the ear of the harpooner. Then he looked at us and brought his finger across his throat. And that's when I realized Gandhi wasn't really going to help us out that day. <laughs> 
And a few moments later, there's this horrendous explosion and this 250-pound uh, harpoon with an exploding tip flew over our head and slammed into the, the backside of one of the whales in front of us. It was a female and she screamed. And that took us completely by surprise because it sounded like a woman in pain. And she rolled on her side in a fountain of blood and all of a sudden the largest whale in that pod slapped the water with his tail and disappeared beneath the surface. And we had no idea where he went. And we had been told by all of the experts that being in that small boat, we would be attacked by the whale. And we had seen all of the old woodcuts of the Yankee whalers being you know, attacked by sperm whales. So it was with a bit of anxiety that Bob and I sat in this little boat waiting for you know, 50 tons of whale to come up underneath of us. But he swam right under us and threw himself out of the water straight at the bow of the Soviet vessel to protect his pod. But they were waiting for them. He had slipped an unattached harpoon and uh, the harpooner pulled the trigger and at point blank range struck the whale in the head. And this large bull sperm whale screamed and fell back in the water and was rolling about on the surface in agonizing pain. Blood everywhere from the two dying whales. It was just total chaos. And suddenly I caught his eye and he looked straight at me and he dove again. And this time I saw a trail of bloody bubbles coming at us real fast. And he came up and out of that water at an angle so that his momentum would throw himself right on top of us. And as his, as his head came out of the water, and I looked up into this eye, this eye that was only about six feet away from me, an eye the size of my fist, what I saw in that eye changed my life forever because I saw understanding. He understood what we were trying to do. And I could see the effort he made as he pulled himself back. And instead of falling on top of us, he began to slide back into the sea. And I saw his eye disappear beneath the surface and he died. He could have killed us, he made the decision not to. So I personally owe my life to that whale. But I saw something else in that eye too, and it was pity, and not for himself, but for us. That we could take life so thoughtlessly, so mercilessly, without any remorse, and why? Why were the Russians killing those whales off the coast of California? They don't eat sperm whales, they make oil from them, sperm oil, spermaceti oil. And one of the primary and most valuable uses of spermaceti oil by the Russians was for the manufacture of intercontinental ballistic missiles. It's a high heat resistant oil. So I said to myself as I sat there and the sun was going down and there's you know, the two dying whales in the water around us, I just said to myself, you know, we're insane. To be doing this, we have to be insane. And it was from that moment on I said, I'm not going to do this for... For, I, I'm not doing this for people, I'm doing it for whales. Uh, that's who my clients are going to be and have always been ever since that day. My clients are the whales and the seals and the sharks and the fish. That's who we represent. So in 1986 when we sank half of Iceland's whaling fleet in Dockside and destroyed their whale processing plant, I actually had a former colleague from Greenpeace came up and he said, I just want to say that what you did in Iceland was despicable, reprehensible, criminal and unforgivable. I said, so? <laughs> He says, I think you should know that you embarrass the entire conservation movement by sinking all those, those ships. I said, hey John, we didn't sink those ships for you. We didn't sink them for Greenpeace and we didn't sink them for any human being on the planet. We sank them for the whales, John. You find me one whale anywhere on this planet that disagreed with what we did that day and I promise you we will not do it again. They are our clients. So we get called many, many things. We're criminals, we're eco-terrorists, we're pirates. But you know, in 35 years of doing this, we haven't caused a single injury to a single person. We haven't sustained any serious injuries to any of our crew, and we've never been convicted of a felony crime. And the reason for that is because we take a very strategic uh, approach to what we do. We operate by enforcement of the laws, not breaking the laws. Of course, sometimes we have to break regional laws, uphold international laws, but we're not afraid to go into court and defend ourselves on those. But the problem is, is that we have all of the rules, the regulations and the treaties and the laws we need to protect our oceans. They're all there. The United States has laws which could end whaling tomorrow, but nobody enforces them because there's a lack of economic and political will to do so. So that's how we get away with what we do, by simply going out and enforcing the law. To give you an example again with Iceland, now you sink uh, half a whaling fleet, that's two ships in uh, Reykjavik Harbor, and we destroyed the whale processing plant. It was uh, $10 million worth of damages, and it shut them down for 17 years. Well, you would think that that would be illegal, and it is in a way, 
but they wouldn't charge me with a crime. I wrote numerous times asking if there was charges, uh, never heard back, so finally I had to get on an airplane and fly to Reykjavik exactly a year later. And I landed at the airport and there was, uh, there was about 150 police officers there to greet me when I arrived, it's rather flattering, and the chief immigration officer, and he came up and says, Captain Watson, how long do you intend to stay in Iceland? I said, I don't know, five, five days, five minutes, five years, so you tell me. Well, we have to go to interrogation. He said, oh, that sounds like fun, let's go to interrogation. So we went to interrogation. He said, are you, admi are you uh, admitting to, to, to sinking these ships? I said, you know, we sunk them, we're gonna sink the other two at the first opportunity. So the next morning, uh, two policemen escorted me to the airport, put me on a plane, and sent me home. The Minister of Justice stood up in the House of Parliament that morning and says, who does he think he is? He comes into our country and demands to be arrested. Get him out of here. They knew that to put me on trial would be to put themselves on trial. And uh, so they, weren't, uh, they didn't want that kind of publicity. So, so we've never were charged with that. So when people say that that's an act of, that's a criminal act, or an, you know, to be a criminal you have to be charged and convicted. We didn't even get into the charging phase of this whole, this whole thing. And so that's what we've been doing ever since, is going after illegal activities. And sometimes we do it blatantly uh, in their face, and sometimes we cooperate. Since 1999, we've been in a, a cooperative program with the government of Ecuador. Uh, we went there to the Galapagos Islands because if we can't save anything as unique, as pristine, as wonderful as the Galapagos, what are we going to save? And that was our line in the sand. So we've gone in there and over the last 12 years, I think we've made quite a difference. We're working in full partnership with the Galapagos Park Rangers and with the Ecuadorian Federal Police. And uh, we've provided a patrol boat. We set up an AIS system for a million euros around there to monitor all the ship's traffic. Uh, we've uh, trained and deployed our own canine unit, which uh, sniffs out shark fins and we also catch tourists smuggling iguanas in water bottles and things like that. But uh, we have also uh, had a surveillance barge up in the Northern Islands and because everybody was getting away with all these crimes of poaching because of the corruption, uh, we actually hired the prosecutor for the Galapagos, who's our lawyer, who's working as prosecutor because under Ecuadorian law they could do that. And we, uh, about four months ago we actually managed to get the, one of the judges fired for, for corruption. And so we're making progress there. And, uh, and it's been very, very, very rewarding. But it, is, it has been difficult. To give you an example, in 2007, I was given the Amazon Peace Prize by the President of Ecuador, and four weeks later he arrested my director for the Galapagos because he happened to bust friends of the President in a shark pinning operation. But using the Ecuadorian media, we were able to expose that, and he had to back off, and, uh, and we were able to, uh, to carry on. So it's controversial there, but it's working. And uh, it's really quite interesting to be uh, working there when you see our, the police dogs with the police with our Jolly Roger logo on their little police jackets. And uh, all the, all the uh, police are carrying our logo on their radios and everything. So it's, uh, that's rather a, a unique sort of thing where a non-government organization has gone in when, and fully partnered with, uh, with a government uh, law enforcement agency. We attract a lot of people from those law enforcement agencies. Our head of, uh, of uh, investigations for Sea Shepherd retired early from the EPA because he said he was so frustrated he couldn't do his job. He had nailed BP in the Alaska slopes and was going to send those guys to jail uh, when he was called in by the Department of Justice and said that BP's pleaded guilty to a misdemeanor. It'll be a $20 million fine. And he says it's unheard of to uh, shut down an investigation in the middle of the investigation before it's complete. He says, don't argue with it's a $20 million fine, that's it. He says, I'm going to send these guys to jail. No, you're not. It's going to be a $20 million fine. And if that had have happened, if he had been successful in his investigation, had it done the job he was hired to do, the Gulf spill may not have happened because those guys would have been in jail. So this is the kind of problems that we have in the country. You know, it's supposed to be a democracy. I call our governments an oilocratic, ugly arky government of the oil companies, by the oil companies, for the oil companies. And we saw that quite. Uh, <laughs> we saw that quite vividly with the BP uh, uh, issue because uh, we weren't allowed to go in there to rescue animals. It was it was a criminal offense to rescue an animal from uh, that was covered in oil. Uh, basically, the government turned everything over to BP, and the only way you could go in there and work was to sign a guarantee that you would not sue BP, you would not say anything bad about BP. 
And uh, I was able to actually, when I did the Larry King show, uh, announced that they were, they were burning the bodies of dolphins, birds, and whales at night. We, we found that information, and it was only because it was on a live program that I was able to, uh, to get that out. And of course, Larry said, oh, that, that can't be possible. We haven't heard about it. And of course, three days later, because I had mentioned it, it did become well known that they were doing that. So they were actually burning the bodies of dolphins and birds and pelicans and everything to try and keep the public from knowing what was going on. Our um, pilot, Dr. Bonnie Schumacher, was uh, flying daily and illegally uh, to get that evidence. And uh, the reason she got away with it is thanks to can't mention who they were, but pretty much all of the air traffic controllers in that area knew she was doing it and didn't say anything to allow that to, to happen. So, you know, it's really good when we have people who are in government who see these contradictions and are willing to, uh, willing to step forth. Uh, head of one of our other investigative teams in Europe, he retired early from the Rotterdam Police Force. Uh, he said, I got tired of arresting uh, uh, people who, three days later, they're back out in the street doing the same thing that they were doing because uh, they just got slapped on, on, on the wrist. And we're finding this all over the world, that uh, people who commit environmental crimes, in fact, it's cheaper for them to just commit the crime and pay the fine than it is to try and go through all the permitting processes and everything. For instance, when I met with the president of Senegal and uh, they're worried about uh, illegal fishing, I said, well, what do you do when you catch a foreign fisherman? He said, well, we give him a fine. I said, what's the fine? $200. He's just taken a million dollars worth of fish out of your waters and you find him $200. I said, seize his ship. And uh, the fisheries minister got really agitated. He says, we can't do that. We don't have a law that can do that. And the president said, well, make one for God's sakes. What are you hire you for? So uh, today, finally, by the way, Senegal, Senegal just kicked out all of their foreign fisheries off of there. So that just happened today. Every single commercial fishery in the world, except for the Alaska wild salmon fishery, is in a state of collapse right now. There's simply too, not enough fish, and uh, it's going to get more and more diminished. I mean, we do see, you go into the supermarket and the fish uh, place is all full, but you know, they're spending more and more money for more and more sophisticated technology, heavy gear technology, to extract the less and less fish. Rayathon probably says it right, they've got a motto on their, on their uh, equipment that says, the fish can run, but they can't hide. And that's true, there's nowhere for them to hide. You know, 12 years ago, you could find Orange Ruffy and Trader Joe's in different places, and you don't see it anymore, it's just disappeared. Here's a fish that took 45 years to become sexually mature and lives to be 200. It's not there anymore. But we've forgotten it, we've just moved on to something else. In fact, we've been very good at adapting and forgetting. 500 years ago, we had sea minks here in Maine. Uh, they're extinct. Walrus were along the northern coast of Maine and off of Nova Scotia, now extirpated in this area. Beluga whales were in Long Island Sound. They're not there anymore. We've forgotten that they were ever there. The polar bear was called the white bear at the time because he used to come down into Vermont and, and Maine and New Hampshire. No more. The giant auk is extinct. The, nor the, the Carolina parakeet, extinct. The eastern bison, extinct. The, the eastern uh, timber wolf, extinct. I mean, I could go on and on about all of the, the species that have gone extinct, and we just certainly, we just forgot they were ever there. Now, the problem is, is that we can only go do this for a certain point. This is not really the planet Earth. This is the planet ocean. Uh, it's an ocean planet, and it's the ocean that regulates everything. It's the life support system for the planet. In fact, what, this, we're, not even, what we're on is a spaceship. This is the spaceship Earth, the spaceship ocean. And it, it's a spaceship in every sense of the word because right now we're traveling at 500 kilometers a second on this incredible trip around the Milky Way galaxy. It's a big trip at 500 miles a second. We've only gone around the galaxy 20 times in the entire history of the planet. It takes 250 million years to make a revolution. But uh, while we're on this spaceship, we are the passengers. We're having a great time entertaining ourselves. And we're neglectful of the crew. The crew that runs this spaceship, that runs the biosphere, which is the life support system for this spaceship, the bacteria, the worms, the insects, the fish, the trees, they are the crew on Spaceship Earth. And we're killing them off. And you know, on any spaceship, you can only, if you start killing off the crew members, you're going to be in a little bit of a problem down the line, that is with the passengers, because they're not going to be able to survive. At what point do we reach that? We don't know. But 
we've become over the last 10,000 years very anthropocentric in our values. We only care about us. We don't seem to really care as a society about, uh, or as a, as a species, about those other species. We forget that there's three laws of ecology. The law of diversity, that the strength of an ecosystem is, within, is the diversity within it. The law of interdependence, that all those species are interdependent with each other. And the law of finite resources, that there's a limit to growth, a limit to carrying capacity. And for our numbers to grow, we literally have to steal the carrying capacity of other species and they have to move off the planet so that we can, they can make more room for more of us. And that's the problem. And when you try to challenge that, it's very, very difficult. You know, three or four years ago, I, I wrote an essay, and I got severely taken to task by the Fox Network, which isn't that unusual, but um, <laughs> they had this thing about it because I said, uh, I said uh, that worms were more important than people. Oh, they got real upset about that. Uh, and I said it for two reasons. One, to get their attention. And two, because worms are more important than people. And uh, when people said, well, how can you say something so outrageous as to say a worm is more important than a, than a person? And I said, well, because it's true. Uh, we, the worms can live on the earth without people, but we can't live on the earth without worms. We can't live without bees, we can't live without trees, we can't live without fish. They're all more important than we are. And if we start to think that we're more important than them, then our days on this planet are certainly numbered. They're all more important. I was doing one right-wing talk show and the woman just said, you called us animals. I am not. An animal. Okay, you can be a vegetable, the rest of us are animals. <laughs> but I felt that, the, you know, we have to, we have to, we had to come up with a strategy where we could challenge these things and at the same time do it in a constructive way. And that's why I came up with this idea called aggressive nonviolence. We're aggressive and we're nonviolent. When people say, oh, you're violent because you sink boats, or you're violent because you confiscate long lines or drift, or drift nets. No, we adhere to Martin Luther King's definition of nonviolence, where he said you cannot commit an act of violence against a non-sentient object. And in fact, when you destroy a harpoon or something which is about to take the life of a sentient being, that, in effect, is an act of nonviolence. You've actually prevented violence against life through the destruction of a non-sentient object. And so that, you know, but we live in a society where the values are such that property is more sacred than life, and so of course it all gets very mixed up in that respect. But in 1985, I had a Tibetan Buddhist monk come to our ship in, uh, in Seattle, and he gave me this little statue. It was sort of a horse-headed, dragon wing sort of thing with a tail and everything. It was very, very colorful, and he said, I've been asked to give this to you, and you can put it up on your mask for protection. I said, okay. I didn't know what it was, but you know, if a Tibetan Buddhist monk comes all that way to give you a little thing and ask you to put it on the mask, we'll put it up there, no problem. So we put it up there, and it was up there for a few years, and then in 1989, I actually had the opportunity to, to meet with and speak with uh, the Dalai Lama, and it was in Washington, D.C., and uh, I said, oh, I got a picture of this thing I want to show you. What is this? And I found out he had sent it to us. It was from him. And I said, well, what is it? He says, it's called Hayagriva. And I said, well, what's that mean? He says, well, it's a symbol for the compassionate aspect of Buddha's wrath. I said, well, what does that mean? <laughs> and he looked at me and said, oh, you never want to hurt anybody. But sometimes, when they cannot see enlightenment, scare the hell out of them until they do. <laughs> so we can be intimidating, and that's one of the reasons we adapted our Jolly Roger flag. That there's another reason for that, but also it's intimidating. A black ships Jolly Roger thing. I mean, the stories out there are absolutely incredible. You know, I, I hear all these stories about all the people I've killed. You know, and of course, if it was true, I'd be arrested. But the fact is, is that uh, they believe it, and that's good because they're afraid of us, and that that works for us. For instance, uh, last year when the Japanese couldn't get a, a refueling vessel. Their own propaganda worked for us because the companies they wanted to charter from were afraid to do it because they knew that we were a bunch of really out of control terrorists down on the bottom of the, of the planet and they weren't going to do it. So it worked, uh, worked in our respect. Now the other reason we have the Jolly Roger is because it goes for historical reasons. We go back to the 17th century when piracy was running rampant through the Caribbean and it wasn't the British Navy or the Spanish navies that were shutting down the pirates for very good reason, because British and Spanish merchants were making a lot of money, and the politicians were taking a lot of bribes. Things haven't changed much, but that's way, you know, that was what was happening back then. And uh, finally, piracy was shut down. Who shut it down? Henry Morgan, a pirate. 
If you want to shut down pirates, you need pirates to do it. Because the great thing about being a pirate is you're not encumbered by bureaucracy. Pirates get things done. And uh, it's no accident that the founder of the United States Navy, John Paul Jones, is a pirate, was a pirate. Uh, he's also, by the way, not many people realize this, the founder of the Russian Navy. So after the revolution, he got bored, Catherine the Great brought him over, and he set up the Russian Navy. So the founder of the two greatest navies in the world was a pirate, as were uh, you know, Sir Walter Raleigh and Sir Francis Drake and Jean Lafitte. So pirates had a pretty good history over the years. In fact, the worst pirate of them all was Long John Silver. Didn't exist, he was just fictional. But uh, not to say there's not bad pirates, but let's take a look also at the pirates of uh, Somalia. Why are they there? They're there because the real pirates came in and turned them into pirates. And who were the real pirates? The Asian and European fishing fleets. They came in and raped the coasts of, uh, of Somalia. Totally took everything, driving those people into poverty and forcing them into piracy. And two years ago, I predicted that the same thing would happen in Mauritania and the Senegal and the Ivory Coast, and it's starting to happen. And that's one of the reasons why Senegal actually has kicked them out, because they're just taking everything. And yet, those are the real pirates. They also dump radioactive material and chemicals in the Somali waters. And so what we have is the Japanese Navy over there protecting the real pirates from the poor teenagers who have to go out and plunder them. I actually came up with an idea for solving this, but of course nobody wanted a real concrete, or a real positive a solution to it. But you know, it costs you $10,000 a day for a ship to, to dock in Dubai. It costs you 14000 uh, well, for a, a freighter ship, it costs you about $150,000 to go through the Panama Canal. If we were to simply have all the shipping companies pay a five to $10,000 fee for passing through Somali waters and have that money distributed amongst the people, it would solve the problem. But nobody wants to deal with that because it'd be giving in to pirates. In fact, what it'd be doing is giving in to uh, Im impoverished teenage kids is what it would be. And it also, keep in mind one thing. No pirate killed anybody off of Somalia until the US military started shooting them and then they started fighting back. But they didn't kill anybody up until that point. And so we're driving people into these sort of situations through the fact that we're stealing their resources. But, uh, you know, it's hard to get that message across. I was actually asked to speak to the French Senate about that, and they seem to take it seriously, but then again, they're governments, and governments don't do anything. Governments cause problems. They don't solve problems, and that's been all the way through history, it's always been the case. Abraham Lincoln did not end slavery in America. Slavery was ended by Douglas and Wilberforce and all of the unsung heroes who fought against it. I think it, uh, I think it was uh, Lincoln who said, if I can win the war by not freeing the slaves, I would do so. You know, it was just convenient. Women got the right to vote in this country not because of Woodrow Wilson, who signed the amendment. He was their biggest opposition while they were trying to get the right to vote and yet he gets the credit for enfranchising women, when in fact he was the enemy. So governments take credit for things, but they don't solve problems. And it, when you want to solve a problem, you have to turn to individuals. The passion, the courage, and the imagination of individuals. That has led every single social revolution in the history of society, and will always do so. Margaret Mead was an early uh, advisor to the Sea Shepherd Society, and uh, she was the one who told me never depend on government to solve any problems. They never have, they never will. All social change comes through the passion of individuals. And what you can do with the passion of individuals is achieve the impossible. Because I've, I'm always optimistic because I believe that the solution always lies in the impossible. What we have to do is make the possible, impossible possible. And the best illustration of that of all is the fact that in 1972, the very idea that Nelson Mandela would be president of South Africa was unthinkable, unimaginable, and impossible. And yet it happened. So I have a lot of faith in young people today to come up uh, with, to use their imagination and passion and courage to find answers to a lot of these problems that right now we don't have any answers to. But the answers are there. And, uh, so that gives me a lot of faith. I've never been pessimistic about, about that. I've seen all over the world solutions being uh, found by people from all different countries and backgrounds and everything. And they find those solutions out of necessity. And because, most importantly, they care. And unfortunately, politicians care about one thing, 
getting elected. And they'll say and do anything to get elected. And uh, so that's been a major, major disappointment in many, many respects. I mean, we've got a prime minister up in Canada who believes that dinosaurs went extinct because they couldn't get on Noah's Ark, you know. So that's the kind of mentality we have to deal with, you know. But, um, so we came up with Sea Shepherd and we came up with all these different ideas to intervene. And how, uh, you know, of course, being a communications major, I realized very early that if it's not on television, it didn't happen. And the most powerful weapon that has ever been invented is the camera. And you can accomplish more with a camera than with a gun. And so we had to get this into the, uh, into the mass media and, and how, how to do that. I went to all of the uh, networks about six years ago and I said, look, the biggest TV show right now on Discovery is about a bunch of guys going into a remote cold area of the Bering Sea to catch crabs. And every week it's the same thing. We're catching crabs. I'll give you men and women from around the world going to a far more remote place into a colder climate to save whales. And we'll throw in icebergs and penguins. It's got to be more compelling than catching crabs. And uh, they all rejected it, of course. Uh, but Animal Planet, actually, Marjorie, uh, when she came and became president of, this, uh, uh, of Animal Planet, she called me up and said, OK, let's go for it. And it was a big risk for her, because their biggest fear was that somebody was going to get killed. So we just completed five seasons uh, in the Southern Ocean, and nobody's been hurt. And what have we achieved during those five seasons? Uh, three years ago, they took only 50% of their quota. The next year, only 17% of their quota. Last year, 26% of their quota. So our objective when going into the Southern Ocean was to sink the Japanese whaling fleet economically, to bankrupt them. And we've done that. They're $200 million in debt now. They will not recover. And during that time, about 3,000 whales have, have been saved. Many more when you consider that over 60% of the whales killed are pregnant. And uh, so that it's been hugely successful in the terms of saving lives and for uh, crippling that illegal industry. It's called the Southern Ocean Whale Sanctuary. I don't know what it is about the word sanctuary they don't seem to understand. Now, the only reason they're continuing is through massive subsidies by the Japanese government. And this last year, it was even... Uh, it was deplorable because they took $30 million from the Tsunami Earthquake Relief Fund to fund their uh, return to the, to the Southern Ocean. And uh, I don't know if they're going to do that again, but we're being prepared to meet them if they do return. Our next campaign is going to be called Operation Zero Tolerance because our objective is to make sure that they take not even one whale. That's what our, we're going to set our, uh, our objective on. And to do that, to do that, we'll be going down stronger than ever with four ships, two helicopters, and 120 volunteers from around the world. Uh, the reason I'm getting a fourth ship is because this last year, the reason they got 26% instead of the 17% the year before was that our ship, the, the Bridge of Bardot, was uh, crippled by a rogue wave and we had to, it had to drop out. So without a scout ship, it's really difficult. So this time we're going to have two scout ships, really fast vessels that will find them. And uh, it's an interesting story with our scout ship. Uh, it was originally, I called it the Gojira uh, two years ago, which is Godzilla in Japanese. I just couldn't resist the title. It had lines in it. And we actually have on camera a Japanese whaler saying, on radio saying, oh my god, we're being attacked by Godzilla. <laughs> so, so classic. Uh, but unfortunately, the only thing, the only thing more uh, scary than, uh, than Godzilla uh, are Godzilla's lawyers, so we had to change the name, so we turned the beast into the beauty and named it the Bridget Bardot, who's been a longtime supporter of ours, and she went up to the seal hunt in 1977 with us. And uh, so, you know, it's really nice to have her name on there, and we're getting a lot of support because of that. Uh, our vessel, is Steve Irwin, of course, is named after Steve Irwin, because Steve was going to come with us that year, the year that he died, and uh, so since he couldn't, I asked Terry if we could put the name on the boat, and she was quite happy to do so. And uh, the Bob Barker, of course, uh, Bob gave us $5 million to buy that boat and get the helicopter, so that's why it's called the Bob Barker. But I have to say, with Bob, I had to like argue with him to get his name on that boat. He didn't want his name involved, but I convinced him that it would actually work in our favor if he did. And, uh, so, and then we'll be getting this uh, fourth vessel, which, uh, w w which we ha should have secured within about a month. Uh, this summer, we're also going into uh, the South Pacific to protect sharks. We've been working on shark protection for 
for many years, but we're going to try and uh, make a television show on that. Uh, it's a different approach because, you know, you see all these shark weeks and everything from National Geographic and whatever, they're all vicious monsters attacking us all over the place. Uh, I want to get an alternative to that. Sharks are not dangerous. We swim with tiger sharks, we swim with great white sharks, you know. They throw all this blood and stuff in the water to attract them, but if you ever notice when they're, they're biting the cage and everything, there's a guy outside with a camera who's not in the cage filming this. Shark's not interested in him. Yes, sharks do attack people, unfortunately, because we look like sea lions when we're on surfboards, and that doesn't work very well for some surfers. But you notice they don't eat them. They take a bite and they're off. It's still not healthy for the surfer. But still, you know, the average number of people killed by sharks every year is five. The average number of people killed by ostriches every year is 100. We don't, we're not down on the ostriches. You know, the ostriches are 20 times more dangerous than sharks. In fact, their chances of getting killed playing golf are far greater than swimming with sharks because more people die from lightning strikes on golf courses than are attacked by sharks in the well. And in fact, the average number of people killed by coke machines falling on them every year is not. So the coke machine there. You know, the fact is you go into the ocean and there's, you know, if you don't know what you're doing, you're going to get, you know, don't take the proper precautions you're going to get hurt. And we've actually identified some of these things of what, why this happens. Why are there so many shark attacks in Western Australia? It's because from Fremantle Port, there leaves every week boats carrying livestock, sheep, and primarily sheep, heading for the Middle East. And when they die, they're thrown overboard. And all the time, they're, 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 they're defecating urinate, which carries blood, straight into the ocean. So the sharks are being drawn into the coast by the fact that there's this constant uh, effluent of blood being poured into the water. And uh, of course, you, when we point that out, nobody wants to listen because there's a lot of money in transporting these, vessel, uh, these uh, sheep to, to market in the Middle East. And uh, they don't want to buy, they, they have to be able to kill the sheep in the Middle East and that's the reason why they have to cut their throat or else they can't eat it. And so they don't want frozen meat, they have to have that way. So that, and it's an extremely cruel pro uh, operation. But one of the side effects are shark attacks. And you find this all over the world, that we do not understand the creatures of the sea. Now the Canadian government, for instance, says, oh, well, we've got to control seals because they eat the fish. Yeah, well, a lot of things eat fish. You know, in fact, domestic house cats eat more fish than all the world's seals put together. 2.8 million pounds of it every year, or tons, I think it is. I mean, and so they, but they definitely eat more fish than all the world seals put together. But we, I don't see anybody out there killing a club and all little, uh, little uh, kit, kitty cats, you know, because they're eating fish. When Jacques Cartier first came across the, the Atlantic in the 1500s, there were 45 million seals off this coast, and no shortage of fish. There were walrus, they're not even here anymore. There were giant hawks, they're not here anymore. There were sea minks, they're not here. All of that life out there and no shortage of fish. Then we come along, scoop it all out of the ocean because we're incredibly greedy, and oh, it wasn't us, it was the harp seals that did it. Harp seals are less than 10% of the original population, but can you listen to the Canadian government? We're out of control. You know, it's absolutely ridiculous. You want more fish? Get more seals. Why? Because the biggest predator of cod, for example, aside from us, are capelin, mackerel, herring, other fish. The very fish that are targeted by the harp seals. And harp seals don't go after cod, they want to go after that. They have to go after cod, there's nothing else, but primarily they're going after all those other fish. And so when you lower harp seal populations, you increase predatory fish populations, causing even greater predation on targeted fish like cod. You know, with the Canadian government, they see three things. Fish, people, seals. That's all they see. There's 970 species interconnected in that ecosystem, all affecting each other. That's where they're failing to, to see the bigger picture. And if they wipe out the sea, oh, it'll be something else. You know, they're killing pelicans in California. Oh, they're eating our fish. They want to kill dolphins in Japan because they're eating our fish. Why is it our fish? You know, what do we ever do to deserve that? We, we didn't raise them except in Alaska. I'll give them credit. You know, the hatchery's there. And that's why they still have a sustainable fishery because they actually put more into the sea than they take out. But, uh, you know, it's an incredibly selfish thing that, uh, that we do and always are constantly looking for scapegoats. If we don't save the whales, we don't save the fish, we don't save uh, the seals, we're not going to save the oceans. And the oceans die, we die. It's as simple as that. We don't live on this planet with a dead ocean. And uh, when people say, well, for instance, well, you're giving a talk in Colorado, what's that got to do with the ocean? 
Well, the fact, well, aside from the fact there are more registered scuba divers in Colorado than any other state, uh, the fact is, is that uh, the fact is is that everywhere on this planet, whether it's in the Sahara Desert or whatever, depends upon our survival because of the health of the ocean. It regulates temperature, provides food, blah blah. And now the Japanese and the Norwegians are in partnership to go off and harvest plankton, phytoplankton, zooplankton, and why? Because they want to make a protein paste for livestock. And by the way, 40% of all of the fish taken from the ocean isn't eaten by people, it's fed to livestock. Pigs are now bigger consumers of fish than sharks. Uh, chickens in factory farms alone in Denmark are eating more fish than all of the puffins in the North Sea and the North Atlantic. So, uh, you know, we're just literally eating the oceans alive. We should incorporate what uh, the Polynesians used to do, which is a thing called taboo. The original uh, meaning of the word taboo was to set off a side uh, area for conservation. In Tahiti or Hawaii, for example, the shaman would say, nobody fishes here, say it's Hawaii. Nobody fishes in Hanami Bay for 20 years. And they were pretty strict on their fisheries regulations. You got caught, you got killed. You know, it was a death penalty for illegal fishing in Hawaii and Tahiti. Uh, and what did that do? It guaranteed that they never were short of fish. We need taboo areas. I call for the entire Mediterranean to be taboo for the next 20, 30 years. And surprisingly, a lot of people are agreeing with that, including fishermen in the Mediterranean, who have seen the incredible diminishment over the, the last 30 years. You, you know, they see that the oceans are dying. Acidification, plastic pollution, so many problems that are, that are affecting our oceans. And for the most part, it's out of sight and it's out of mind. And so, what we've developed with Sea Shepherd is direct intervention and at the same time utilizing the media to get our message across. We live in a media culture. Like I said, it's not real unless it's on television. And for that reason, we try to incorporate the rules of the media in our campaign. And the media has rules. They're only interested in four things. Sex, scandal, violence, celebrity. Every story has one of those elements. If it doesn't, no story. You have all four elements, you have those stories you never get rid of. They just keep going on and on. So those are the L4 elements of media. To give you an example, I led a campaign against the killing of wolves in northern uh, British Columbia in the Yukon back in 1984. And it was a perfect story. It got headlines for two to three weeks because they had them killing wolves from helicopters. They had them uh, threatening to kill us if we intervened. So we had the violence thing down pretty good. Uh, we caught an environment minister who took a bribe from a big game hunting organization. So that got us the scandal part of it. So I simply recruited Bo Derrick as our spokesperson for the campaign. <laughs> At the press conference, one of the reporters from the Vancouver Sun said, what's Bo Derrick know about wolves? This is absolutely ridiculous that she's your spokesperson. Well, if I had Dr. David Meck or Dr. Gordon Haver, two of the foremost wolf biologists in the world here, it'd be an empty room. Nobody would be interested. I see the room is packed. It'll be the headline of your newspaper tomorrow. You're going to write it. There's nothing, nothing you can do about it. And that was where it was. You can place your news story if you can dictate that. That's why we took Brigitte Bardot out to the ice blows of Newfoundland. We knew that when we got her cheek to cheek with a baby seal, that gave us a cover of Perry Match, Gunter Stern, all over the world. Because the media cannot resist that sort of thing. People say, well, you're a media manipulator. Duh. <laughs> so is in Coca-Cola and the President of the United States. You know? How do you get anywhere if you don't manipulate the media? You give the media what the media wants. We're not on animal planet because uh, we're trying to save whales. We're on animal planet because we're crazy. You know, they want to see some, they want to see action out there, and we give them that action, but we tag the message to to that action. And this is how you get your point across. And uh, it's been very very successful over the years. It's no mistake that the Greenpeace Foundation was not founded by environmental activists or or academics. It was founded by journalists. It was the first journalist-founded organization. Communications majors, Bob Hunter was a columnist for the Vancouver Sun, Bette Metcalf worked for the CBC. You know, they understood that we lived in, an, uh, in a world where the media defines reality. And so we had to take, uh, take advantage of that. And uh, so that's what we've been doing over the years, using a combination of communicating through the media and at the same time, direct intervention to actually save lives and show real results. And uh, it's been quite effective. And I'm, I try to encourage and hopefully encourage other peoples to take those lessons and approach things in, in a similar way. And in fact, that is ha has happened. We have young people come all the time and say, well, what, what, what can we do about this? Well, I said, what do you want to do about it? Well, what can we do? Think about it. Use your imagination. Best example is in 1979, I had an 18-year-old boy come to me and he says, 
after we just hunted down the pirate whaler Sierra, we had rammed it, we chased it into the coast of the Sierra, it was all, and we shut it down. We ended his career forever. And uh, right in the dock, he said, what are we going to do about laboratory animals? I said, Alex, uh, this is the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society. We're not going to do anything about laboratory animals, but if you're interested, why don't you do something about laboratory animals? And he said, well, what can I do? I said, well, just think about it. Use your imagination. He went back to Maryland, got a job in a lab, exposed all the brutality of the chimpanzees, got it in secret cameras, got it out to the Washington Post, got it out to CBS, exposed the whole thing, shut them all down. People actually went to jail from what he actually uh, had recorded. And then he set up his own organization, People for the Ethical Treatment of Animals. And what I've always encouraged, it doesn't matter what your approach is, what social issues you're concerned with, that you as an individual uh, have the power to, to change things. Each and every one of us has that power. And that, I think, is the most important thing that we do with Sea Shepherd is try to give people the sense of empowerment that they can make a difference. And we're now working with uh, different groups around the world. We try to work very closely with surfing surfers, uh, with, uh, with uh, scuba divers, and with yachts people, and, uh, and with artists, all the different peoples around the world. We try to get into those communities. One of the things we joke about when it comes to our, our media profile is that uh, you know, on our board of uh, advisors, we have, uh, we have Christian Bale, we have William Shatner, we have Pierce Brosnan, we have Sean Connery, and we have Richard Dean Anderson. We can't fail. We got Batman, Captain Kirk, two James Bonds in the guy. And by the way, we also have on our board of directors Anthony Kiedis with the Red Hot Chili Peppers, and he's the one who's funding our uh, trip with the RV out there because uh, Kelly, Kelly here is, uh, on, uh, is, is our Sea Shepherd crew member on tour with the Chili Peppers right now, so everywhere they play, we are. And uh, so that's uh, you know, giving us a good profile and reaching a lot of people, people that way. Again, it's because uh, musicians and actors and people like that have the ability to reach a lot of people. And uh, you know, one of our most active members, of course, is Martin Sheen. And uh, somebody accused Martin of you know, using, being a, an actor who is a, you know, just being an activist. He said, no, I'm an activist who happens to be an actor. And uh, I think he's been arrested in more than anybody I've ever known, I think 135 times or something like that. But why? Because he cares. And when people say, well, you know, you're only doing this because you're a celebrity. No, it's because I'm a celebrity that I can do it. And uh, that's, I think, is a responsible thing to do, is use your celebrity status to get a message across. It doesn't matter what, whether it be, you know, what, what charitable ex, uh, approach you're using, but at least you're giving something back in some way. And that's what I think it's our duty, our obligation, and responsibility for each and every one of us to make sure that we give to this planet more than we've taken away from it and, uh, and to represent all future generations. Because we don't represent the minority. We represent the majority. All of those people who have yet to be born over the next thousand years, if we survive, they're the ones who are going to judge us. 500 years from now, they're going to look back and say, who did what? And those, that's when they're going to decide you know, who is going to be revered and who is going to be reviled. Because uh, for the most part, everything, that, everything we do today uh, will see how the world is tomorrow. And to be a, an environmentalist, a conservationist, you have to look at the world not in just four years' time or eight years' time, but a hundred years' time, a thousand years' time, a million years from now. What will this planet be a million years from now because of what we do today? Because every time we remove a species, we cause problems. Our ships are the only ships in the world that fly the flag of the five nations. Uh, the Mohawks gave us that, those flags, and the reason they gave them to us is because they said that we can see that you represent one of the foundations of our belief, and that is you make no decision in your life until you take into account that decision on all future generations. And so every, we report to the women of the Longhouse of the Mohawks with what we do, and uh, they keep us uh, supplied with their, with their flags. And uh, we're very, very proud to be associated with them. In fact, that's, you know, all the flags we fly, that's the flag we're most proud of. The other thing with when it comes to, I'll just finish with the one thing with our flags, that's always been an interesting thing because with our flags, we're constantly being politically harassed. Uh, so that's the weapon they can use against us. They'll pull our flag. Our Canadian flag was pulled. Our British flag was pulled. All Japan has to do is say the word bang, pull our flag. We had the Belize flag for 19 days. As soon as they found out, the Japanese had it pulled, pulled, pulled. So you can't go to sea without a flag, so what do we do? So we're all registered, uh, we started registering our ships in the Netherlands. 
Now, what happened? Japan went to the Netherlands and said, you've got to get rid of that flag. And the Dutch foreign minister said, oh my God, yes, we better get rid of that flag. So the Dutch foreign minister went to the ship's registry and says, pull their flag. And then the Dutch foreign ministry and the Dutch government found something very interesting that we didn't even know, that the Dutch government has no power to pull a Dutch flag off a Dutch vessel. So, we're not going to lose those flags. Actually, we're going to try and set legislation. It would have taken them five years to actually get the legislation to do it, but then the government fell. And then last week, the government fell again. So, well, I don't think we're going to lose the flag. But if we do lose it, Monaco's there to give us the flag. Prince Albert said we can have his. So we still have those flags. And we've just registered the Bridge of Bardot in Australia. So we've actually got the Australian flag going there for us, too. So, uh, but again, our ultimate flag, of course, is the, is the Jolly Roger, and uh, that's the flag of the Sea Shepherd Society. And the other great thing about the Jolly Roger is kids really seem to like it. And uh, so that we've attracted a lot of attention from children all over the world because of that. I don't know what it is about the fascination with pirates with children, but sort of like the fascination with dinosaurs, I guess. But, uh, but they like it, and we're glad they like it, and uh, we're, we're, you know, we get an awful lot of uh, kids that uh, apply for the crew. Of course, they have to wait till they're 18. Uh, so anyway, thank you very much for listening to me. I, I don't know what the time is. I can't have got a clock here, so I don't know if I've gone too long or not. But uh, thank you very much. And uh, if anybody has any questions, I'd certainly be happy to, to answer them. We've got to we have people line up for the mic. For okay. in Japan is that the ICR, the Institute for Cetacean Research, is actually owned by the government. And uh, they bought it off from private ventures, so they own it, they subsidize it. But the problem that you have in Japan is that people who retire, retiring politicians are given these really high paying jobs with various government uh, businesses. And the people who got those jobs at the ICR, they don't want to lose their jobs. So that's one of the reasons that they keep perpetuating the ICR through, uh, through subsidies. And the other thing is that the, the sailors, or the whalers themselves, who are employed on the ships, are employed by a union run by the Yakuza, or the Japanese Mafia. And uh, how do I know that? First of all, people tell me also I openly say that in, in Japan, and nobody denies it. So. <laughs> You know, but the uh, the Yaku that they have a lot of strong influence on it too. Is there any pressure put on Japanese that this is a dissident? Actually, I 
actually a uh, scientific exploration that the meat that's harvested is given free instead of sold? Well, there's a lot of pressure being put on, on Japan. By the way, you know, Japan is suing us in the United States. It's very interesting. Uh, they, with, the, with the subsidy money, they came after us and they tried to get an injunction in a Seattle court to uh, keep us from going down there. But the American judge, uh, Judge uh, uh, Jones, Richard Jones, he's Quincy Jones's brother, actually. But uh, Judge Jones uh, ruled that, uh, that he would deny the injunction, saying, look, you know, you guys, the whalers, are in contempt of court in Australia, so what are you coming in my court trying to get something you couldn't get into Australia? But we're hoping it will go to trial. We would love nothing better than to go to trial with the Japanese because we've told them they have to produce their research uh, papers, which they don't have any, and they have to give their coordinates where they operate, which they won't because they don't want to, you know, say where they were as far as Australia's lawsuit against them. So they're in a position where they're trying to uh, get this injunction, but they refuse to cooperate with the American court. So it's not going to go anywhere for them. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering what your like, first reaction was when you heard the, uh, that the Abbey was uh, I was uh, 200 and I don't know why I'm talking straight here. I was 250 miles from the uh, from the uh, Audigil at the time, and um, uh, so we. My first reaction was to try and find out what was going on, and I radioed the Bob Barker to find out what was going on. Um, the boat was the Shonamaru number two burn, turned into the Audigil and cut it in half, but uh, Pete Bassoon should, should have been a little more careful on that and shouldn't have had his vessel in that position. So the New Zealand uh, safety, maritime safety ruled that both parties were, were negligent over that. Mm -hmm. This is Jerry Conway. <laughs> is um, you've been conducting a very high profile uh, um, program to focus on the whales. There is the International Whaling Commission. Mm -hmm. What can we do to influence them? I know Japan has a very strong word in my source. And is in fact anything can be done by Sea Shepherd or is there any other organization that can influence them to change their whole life? I don't really think so. In 1968, the Mexican delegate to the IWC said, in the future this will be known by as a small band of greedy individuals who condemn the world's whales to oblivion for a few dollars. That's what she said about it. And they, they passed all these rules and regulations, of course. They declared the moratorium on whaling in 1986, but it wasn't followed up with any real you know, enforcement other than the, uh, you know, the regulations in, in different countries like the United States or whatever. For instance, the United States could end whaling tomorrow under the Packwood, Magnuson, and Pelly Amendments, which state that any country that uh, breaks these rules will lose their rights to sell their fish products in the United States, their fish, uh, sport fishing gear in the United States. And every year, the president of the United States, from Ronald Reagan on, every one of them has said that they've chosen to discriminate on the application of the law and instead they send a strongly worded letter of condemnation and every year of course they condemn that. It has worked with Iceland. Uh, the Obama administration sent a letter to Iceland and they, they're not killing fin whales this year. They're still killing minke whales but they stopped killing fin whales because the US threatened them with sanctions. But that is the teeth of the IWC is the participating nations taking action. Australia is now taking Japan to court in the international court, but it could take a long time to do it. But the idea that IWC themselves don't really have any enforcement powers. And we go to the meetings. I'm actually quite proud of the fact that I've been banned from the IWC since 1986 because of that Iceland thing. But in fact, it's worked in our favor because we go there and uh, we're, we're, we have to stay on the sidewalk outside, but that's where all the journalists are, so we get to talk to them. And I don't want to go to those boring meetings anyway. But. Uh, but the IWC, uh, what it does give us is it gives us the rulings that we can then say, oh, well, this is a violation of the IWC regulation. So what we're doing, in effect, is enforcing IWC regulations without their permission. But at the same time, it gives us some sort of legal authority on that. Thank you. And thank you for all the work you're doing with the right whales. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Thank you for everything you do. Your you and the other Sea Shepherd crew really heroic. I have a question. I'm concerned about tuna in, the, in our seas, and I know you've done some work on uh, Sea Shepherd with that and big eyes tuna in particular, the beautiful creatures, and I'm worried about overfishing. And I was wondering if you could share a little bit about what you've done around the, uh, the tuna in our oceans. 
We've had two campaigns with uh, bluefin tuna in the Mediterranean uh, l last year and the year before off the coast of Libya and uh, we found an illegal operation in 2010. We cut the nets and released 800 of the tuna. We're now in court in Britain because the Maltese company that owned the boat is suing us. And, uh, but uh, I think we, we got a good chance of winning on that. I was actually a little shocked in the British courts when I said, these guys are poachers, they're catching fish illegally. And the British uh, court said, well, it doesn't matter if they're illegal, it's still their property. Well, how's it? They're, well, now possession is nine tenths of the law, but they stole it. Oh well. Anyway, that's the kind of stuff you got to deal with all the time. But anyway, uh, this last year it was really interesting because we were operating in the war zone off of Libya, or only a few miles off the, the, because no fishing was allowed in that area at all. And the NATO ships were actually very cooperative. They were actually giving us, uh, if they spotted any fishing boats, we could go after them and 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 chase them out. Although one morning it was a little uh, nervous because uh, it was it was still dark, and this one NATO warship said, "Identify yourself immediately, or prepare to be annihilated." Uh, I said, "Well, yeah, well, this is the Steve Irwin. Good morning to you too." And uh, but um, anyway, that, well, that was a successful campaign to, to keep them out of there. Uh, but here's the problem with the bluefin tuna. It's what I call the economics of extinction. The companies that are catching them would probably like them to go extinct. Now, it doesn't sound very logical, except it works this way. One bluefin tuna, on average, is worth $70,000. It's the most expensive fish on the planet. Some of them sell for up to $300,000. With that kind of price on your head, your chances of surviving are pretty, and they're down to 4% of their original population. <laughs> The uh, scientists in Europe will set the, say, well, we, you should be zero quota. And then the European Fishing Commission will set the quota at 12,000 tons. Then they actually take 60,000 tons and there's no consequences, no penalties on that. So it's, uh, they're re li literally being driven into extinction. The reason for this is Mitsubishi and companies like that in Japan are packing them into warehouses splash frozen. They got a six year supply, they love nothing better than a 10 or 15 year supply. Because the more, the more fish they get into those warehouses, the more diminished they are in the ocean. And diminishment translates into higher prices. So the price is constantly rising as the numbers go down. If you wipe them out completely in the ocean, there's no bluefin tuna left, you've got a priceless commodity in your warehouse, you've got a million dollar fish. So that's all they're looking at is dollars and cents. They do not care. You know, we got the support in Malta of the artisanal fishermen because they know what these people are doing. You know, you have two types of fishermen on this planet. You've got, you know, artisanal fishing, you've got people who actually do it because well, it's, a, it's what they do for a living, and then you've got these mega corporations that are going there and raping the planet, and the people who are suffering the most are the, those fishermen themselves who can't catch anything. You know, we're always being told, well, environmentalists are the biggest threat to, to fishermen. No. You know, the Norwegian fishing fleet went down the coast of India, took everything, and drove one million fishermen into, uh, into unemployment. But you never hear that in the, in, in the New York Times, you know? I mean, they don't report on that. They just report, oh, environmentalists shut down this fishing operation. Yeah, we shut down industrial fishing operations. We don't shut down little guys. Hi, I'm Todd Clay. I'm a member of the Boston Volunteer and a member of the Boston Volunteer Organization. And, uh, I, uh, I noticed that you, uh, you mentioned that you're getting a new ship and uh, another helicopter. And um, is it very difficult to, uh, to, uh, to acquire uh, material like that? Or it seems like I would, you know, I would hope that there would be more people donating enough, you know, uh, equipment like ships and helicopters and everything else. That would, it would be a larger organization to be able to uh, well, more, I hope. And, um, and, uh, I know my nephew's a fisherman just locally, and um, they, uh, they recently put pingers on the nets to help you know, stop catching dolphins in the uh, nets. But um, is there more they can do that would keep uh, dolphins safer around here? And who would be contacted in order to uh, extend that, um, that uh, ability to have pingers on nets and whatnot? Well, I always uh, just to have people say to work with, uh, you know, grassroots organizations in your community, people here in Maine and everything, they know more about it than I would. And I'm sure there's a lot of things that, that can be done in, in this particular area. Uh, one of the things we do in the Galapagos, by the way, is that the industrial fishing fleets, they, they deploy these things uh, called Zuni balls. Uh, what they do is they drop them in the water, they float around and when they detect fish, they send a signal to the satellite telling them that the fish are there and then the fishermen boats come out and get them. And so one of the programs that we've done there, these are worth $5,000 a piece by the way. So we've uh, got all the local fishermen in the Galapagos, we pay them 100 bucks a piece for a Zuni ball. I think we have 90 of them now. And uh, so, you know, so we encourage them to, to grab that. And you find these fish finders and we encourage people. And a lot of, uh, you know, if you come across uh, the long lines and everything to destroy them. I got a call from National Marine Fisheries a few years ago saying, I understand you're seizing and destroying long lines. Yes, you can't do that. Why not? Well, it's illegal. What law are we breaking? Well, I don't know, but that's private property. It's got to be illegal. Well, when you find out what law I'm breaking, get back to me. We never heard from them again. You know, most of the long lines. There's 60,000 miles of long line being set in the oceans every day, and most of it's illegal. You know? and, uh, about the equipment, 
Oh, that. Yeah, we haven't had many things, uh, many boats donated, but. Uh, it's incredible because it's such an important thing that you think more people step up. Well, except the boats that we look for generally tend to be military, and uh, so we get them. Like we bought the Steve Irwin, we bought from uh, Scottish uh, Fisheries Enforcement. It was a, a fisheries patrol vessel, and uh, so. But they don't cost that much, actually. Those big ships don't cost as much as you think. Uh, the Steve Irwin costs $1.7 million. That's like two loads of fuel, you know. So uh, the ships themselves don't cost much. It's the running of the ships that cost, cost a lot, you know. So they're ex extremely expensive. 80% uh, of our budget goes towards running those ships. Well, I don't want to get. I don't want to get that. I don't want to get too big. I don't want to get too big because I think as soon as you get certain, too big, then you no longer are an effective organization. What we need are thousands of grassroots organizations run by tens of thousands of people who are impassioned all over the world. That's what makes the difference. Don't, we can't depend on these big organizations to get anything done because what happens when it becomes a big organization is now you're only concerned about direct mail and fundraising and what the accountants and the lawyers have to say and you can't make a decision anymore because you've got to check with about 25 different lawyers before you can do anything. We can make a decision in an afternoon and if the lawyers say we can't do it, we say, well, no. In, in fact, I've always found it best not to talk to the lawyers before, until after. <laughs> Uh, first of all, I want to thank you tremendously, much gratitude for the work that you do. It's just phenomenal to, to see that you're out there and you're never going to quit and you're so dedicated. And uh, that uh, seeing examples like that gives me hope and courage to keep uh, keep on in our efforts. Uh, I saw the, um, the influence that uh, corporate control has over our governance. And I'm, I'm working with an organization, actually a large coalition called Move to Amend, and we are trying to get our constitution amended to uh, deny personhood to corporations, and I wonder if you might be willing to add an endorsement to that. Oh, certainly, yeah. Outstanding, thank you. And uh, I'm a certified helicopter pilot and a diver to search and rescue person, so I'm <laughs> able and willing any time. <laughs> Yeah, you can get a crew application off of our website, too. But uh, yeah, one of the things I have to say is that I would not be able to get anything done out there if it wasn't for the, the courage, the imagination, and the passion of those crew members that come on board. You know, we get criticized that, uh, oh, you know, your crew are amateurs or not professionals. I don't want professionals. I couldn't pay people to do what these people do. You know, back in 1910, when Shackleton was going to the south, Southern Ocean to, to Antarctica, the London Times severely criticized him because his crew were amateurish. They weren't professional. And his answer is the same answer I give today. He said, I don't want professionals. I want people with a passion to get me where I'm going. And you don't buy that. And so that's, uh, that's really what makes a difference, I think, with our organization is that 80% uh, of the crew are, are volunteers. We have to pay some people. I mean. Volunteer chief engineer is going to get us in trouble. So, <laughs> but 80% of them are volunteers. It makes all the difference in the world. What was your reaction when you got shot? Well, it wasn't. <laughs> well, actually, I, I didn't actually feel it. So, uh, you know, I just uh, noticed that there was a hole there. Uh, <laughs> There's all, you know, it's so much speculation, oh, yeah, well, he wasn't really shot because if he had been shot, he would have been thrown against the bulkhead. They don't understand ballistics. The power of a bullet is no, when it strikes something, is no, no bigger than the, the ricochet when it's fired. So actually, you know, the problem is we're used to seeing people get shot on television and that's not very realistic. But uh, fortunately, I had a bullet-proof vest and we do have these bullet-proof vests. That makes, <laughs> that's a, you know, we've been shot at a lot in the past, so it's good to have that. We also have Kevlar helmets too. But, uh, and they, they also were throwing concussion grenades at us. This year, I think they were throwing spears, bamboo spears and uh, grappling hooks and nuts and bolts and different things at us. But uh, the, crew, the crew have the helmets and, uh, and that. So it's, it is dangerous, but uh, we, may, we take a lot of precautions uh, on that. Uh, the most dangerous thing this last year was they threw grappling hooks into our boats. And uh, 
When that first happened, it ripped through somebody's uniform. If it had grabbed the arm, it would have pulled him overboard. But it, then it ripped through one of the seats and part of the transom on the, on, the, on the Zodiac. So that's a big difference. We're going down there doing what we're doing, uh, trying, making sure that we don't hurt them, but they're trying to kill us. So it's a very one-sided sort of thing. One more. Two more questions. Um, <clears throat> One easy one. What is your age range of the females on your crew? Well, the, uh, you can join the crew at uh, 18. Yeah. Uh, the oldest crew member we had was a woman from England, Joan Court. She was 86. So that was our oldest crew member. <laughs> so I would say, I don't know, Kelly, what would you say the average age of the women on the crew are? We calculated. I think it's uh, maybe 30 or something. Yeah. And, and we try to encourage, we, we, we we try to get a 50-50 male-female, but it never seems to work that way. But uh, at one point, I actually had more women than men on the crew, but that was a rarity on that. But uh, women are better crew members, by the way. <laughs> yeah, they, uh, they, don't, um, they don't complain and whine as much. <laughs> <laughs> Second question. Um, I had been called a black harvest, and we were arrested in 86. Mm -hmm. um, were you really concerned entering the Tatojuan this past season? No. Getting arrested or not getting arrested? You looked very concerned? Was that just... Oh, I look concerned? You looked really concerned that you may be arrested. Oh, uh, yeah, they, you got to you got to look concerned, yes. You were concerned, too. Could they have arrested you or not? No. I didn't think so. Well, here's what happened is that the, the, the Faroese strategy for dealing with us is really interesting. When we came in, they said, oh, well, we're not going to kill any whales. Because if we don't kill any whales, you're not going to have a television show. If you don't have a television show, we win. And after it was all over and they didn't kill any whales, I said, well, you know, you don't understand. Our TV show's about not killing whales. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they didn't kill any whales while we were there. Now, the, uh, and so what we achieved, actually, in the ultimate, what we achieved was to get this known worldwide. People didn't even know about this, and now that's the big achievement: is getting people people know about it. They're under tremendous pressure right now to uh, you know against this. And they say, well, it's legal. Yes, it is, and it isn't because see, it it's illegal under European Union regulations. The Faroes claim an exemption under the European regulations, but they receive 150 million dollars in subsidies from the EU. So our attitude is, if you're going to take the money, you better abide by the regulations. So that's why we're putting pressure on Denmark to to have them conform with the with the regulations. Do you feel optimistic about everything you're going to Yeah, I, I always feel optimistic, but always you you have to just be persistent. You know, we fought, fought the seal hunt in Canada for what 35 years. It's still going on, but commercially, it's over. I mean, with Europe, European Union, Russia, uh, the U.S. not buying those silt pelts. You know, the thing is, the only language anybody really understands when you get it down to it is economics. You know, destroy the market, you've won the day. So that's what you have to go for, so, you know, to destroy the market. And uh, the market for seal products is practically non-existent now. I think they're trying to get into China, but even the Chinese are balking at, at that. Nobody wants that kind of uh, association. Thank you for having me. Thanks. Good. Yeah.